Hey, it's Mike here, and today, plants are trying to kill you, debunked. Yes, I'm going to be responding directly to a YouTube video presentation on the channel Low Carb Down Under, which came out late last year, a few months back, and a few of you have messaged me about it, wanting me to respond, and it's approaching half a million views, so I gotta get in there. Yes, it appears that killer cabbages could be coming for you. Murder mangoes, sassafras assassins, deadly dill pickles, assault soy, killer kohlrabi. The presentation is by carnivore doctor Andrew Chafee, and we'll even cover some of his anti-vegan claims on Insta briefly. You see that the presentation focuses on scare tactics around phytochemicals, while completely ignoring the massive body of research on actual human health outcomes from those phytochemicals. Brussels sprouts alone had over 136 identified human carcinogens in them. And even in several cases, he's trying to scare you about a plant and a health condition when that exact plant and its particular phytochemical he's talking about is actually shown to be beneficial or associated with less of that disease. It's crazy. Anyway, this is like a 30 minute presentation, so I'll try to hit everything. Let's go. And I will say he starts out with the premise that is valid, that plants are trying to survive and they do create defense chemicals. He just really puts in the fear mongering from there. And while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't. And so they use a lot of different things, but poison is one of their main deterrents. They use these defense chemicals. And yeah, that's true. A ton of plants create these chemicals. I mean, we've got poison ivy to poison hemlock. And his premise is, hey, even if it doesn't kill you, it could be harming you. We'll investigate that, he continues. Again, just, just botany biology 101. I literally learned this in seventh grade that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race. Plants becoming more and more poisonous so less and less animals can eat them so that they can survive and thrive. Here's the thing though, through human ingenuity, cultures over thousands of years have been winning that evolutionary arms race. I mean, we have things like cooking that no other animal has. People have bred foods to have lower content of these. Heck, sometimes these defense chemicals even benefit us. I mean, that's what antioxidants are. So in that sense, we've adapted to eating a lot of plants. You know, those mustard greens as they're being being chewed by a caterpillar produce more of chemicals that are going to deter those caterpillars, but can actually help us fight diseases like cancer. So what does he say to eat instead? What's the food here? Well, he goes through his dietary history a bit. Um, the way I came to a, a, the way of eating that I do, which is really just meat and water, is 22 years ago when I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle, we went over how plants use defense chemicals, Yes, he eats an all meat diet and just wait because this gets good with his reasoning. We were looking at this from a cancer perspective. So we were looking at carcin carcinogens and we learned 20 years ago that Brussels sprouts alone had over 136 identified human carcinogens in them. So because of my fear of cancer, I have decided to make my diet entirely of a class 2A carcinogen, according to the WHO, which is of course red meat. Yeah, this really sound logic. You know, he goes a little bit more into this research in a second, but he never really shows a list of these super freaky carcinogens, just hundreds of them. But also spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, literally given pages and pages of every plant that you've ever come across in the grocery store, and not a single one had less than 60 known human carcinogens in them. And he mentions a lot of cruciferous vegetables, and hey, they must just riddle your body with tumors with the 60 plus carcinogens in them each. Well, let's look to the actual research on cruciferous vegetables and cancer. Oh my God, this one from the Annals of Oncology is about cruciferous vegetables and cancer. I'm worried. But weird, once a week versus almost no consumption of these cruciferous vegetables was associated with a 10 to 30% lower odds of this massive list of cancer, depending on the cancer. And for another dramatic one from Japan, more cruciferous vegetable intake meant as much as a 50% reduction in lung cancer for non-smokers. You're getting the point. He then recalls his professor's view because he's talking about his college experience. Our professor must have just read our minds. He looked at us like, you guys aren't getting this. And he just said, I don't eat salads. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. <laughs> Plants are trying to kill you. Yeah, this professor is PH dumb. <laughs> he uh, elaborates on, well, it's not that funny. He then elaborates on the carcinogen thing, which gives us a hint. So this is the study from Professor Bruce Ames from Berkeley. This was published in 1989. And he showed that just the natural plants and vegetables 
contain 10,000 times more naturally occurring pesticides by weight than the industrial pesticides that we were using on them. And 42 toxins, 20 of which were shown to be carcinogenic in mice. Yeah, it appears that they took some like trace chemicals that are in some plants and blasted mice with these and oh, something went wrong. Uh, it's not clear by what standard these are considered carcinogens, but I'll just say that there is one very dangerous chemical that causes asphyxiation in mammals after just minutes, and that is known as dihydrogen monoxide, AKA water, y'all so gullible. The point is all this is about context, and maybe there are some little chemicals in there that can have a negative effect in certain amounts, but these are vegetables that are associated with lower cancer again and again. It's about context. You know, Brussels sprouts are not considered carcinogenic by the WHO, yet uh, yeah, red meat is once again. And maybe that is part of the reason why the diet that they are promoting here, a low carb diet from meta-analyses over and over again, is associated with about 30% increased all-cause mortality. Yeah, low carb down under, how about low carb six feet down under? Now let's hit on some of the various phytochemicals that he talks about, one of which is oxalates. Uh, oxalates is something that, that people know a bit about. Uh, they, they cause inflammation and damage in your body. They also bind minerals. They uh, have uh, are been associated with kidney stones as well. He goes into the concern with kidney stones here, but you know, from this paper, people with higher intake of dietary oxalates you know, from plants didn't really have much of a higher incidence of kidney stones. And again, let's just throw it into context, looking at you know, oxalate-rich plant foods like dark leafy greens from this study, which is actually a meta-analysis of 24 meta-analyses. Green leafy vegetables were associated with lower all-cause mortality as well as heart disease and stroke. But guess what does seem to be a risk as well, and that is red meat consumption. From this study, each 100 gram increment of red meat intake was associated with about a 40% increased risk of kidney stones. And then here's another study that just echoes that. I figured I'd include it. However, in this second study, fruit and fiber intake were also associated with lower risk of kidney stones, but vegetables were neutral. Looking to the urology group, in addition to saying just don't slam down high oxalate foods, they say that your liver can also make oxalate from excess protein, particularly true for beef, pork, chicken, and fish. Interesting. And yeah, it's not a good idea to go completely insane with spinach or anything, but it also is the case that boiling from this study reduces the oxalate from, you know, 30 to 87%. Also, a cool fact, our gut bacteria can digest oxalates if you have the right ones in there. And on the topic of the gut, let's get to today's sponsor, which is Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, which is a prebiotic and a probiotic. And today we're going to investigate what the heck a prebiotic actually is. And we also have a massive limited discount for you guys as well. Prebiotics are fibers that are generally indigestible to us, but the good bacteria in our large intestine can ferment them and use them as food and thrive down there off them. And yes, you heard fiber. In other words, prebiotics are essentially synonymous with plants. And from this 2019 paper on the subject, to get complicated, we're talking about various oligosaccharides being the most common prebiotics, which are fermented by gut bacteria to produce short chain fatty acids. Those have a ton of benefits, but first I just wanna say that Seed has chosen to use a pomegranate based prebiotic, which is a cool double whammy because it's loaded with antioxidants and get this. Short chain fatty acids are anti-inflammatory, immune regulatory, anti-obesity, anti all of that stuff. You can just pause to read. And in terms of what these prebiotics are feeding in the case of Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, we are talking about 53.6 billion active bacteria cell units from 24 different strains that are scientifically backed to support us in areas such as digestive, heart, skin, and gut health, as well as micronutrient synthesis. And Lindy and I have been taking these since 2021, and she says that no other probiotic has had the effect of Seed, which is awesome. And finally, for that special deal, you can use the code Mike, M-I-C, for 30% off your first month's supply of seed. And that is only until April 25th. After that, it goes down to 20%. All right. 
All right, now let's get to lectins. And I have a whole video responding to Dr. Gundry, who's obsessed with lectins, who he mentions briefly. Going into some of the, the, the specific categories, such as lectins, Dr. Uh, Gundry wrote an entire book called The Plant Paradox, talking about how toxic lectins are, and then concluded that you should eat a plant-based diet, which I don't think I would come to that same conclusion. <laughs> Kidney beans are probably the main concern here, but again, we figured this one out in our unique human way from this study. Yeah, quote, cooking of beans completely destroyed the lectin activity. Completely. It can also bind to leptin receptors and leptin, so this is, um, leptin is obviously a, a satiety signal. Then you're not able to see your satiety signals and you end up overeating and you overeat and you overeat and this is why we overeat. Yeah, I have a whole video on leptin that I made pretty recently, but he's actually saying here that lectins can mess with your leptin, that fat hormone, actually make you more hungry and lead to obesity. Is that the case with higher lectin foods like beans? Are they fat promoting? No, absolutely not. From you know our government data, adults who consume beans on a regular basis are about 22% less likely to be considered obese compared to those who did not consume beans. The study uh, looking at people with uh, isocaloric uh, intake and just one just removed lectins and they all lost weight and the others didn't and it lost a significant amount of weight. Now there's no citation here, I had to dig, I did every single possible combination of like isocaloric, lectin free, diet, trial, blah 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 and this is like the first time from one of these videos I was not able to find the study. I don't see any compelling evidence out there for this. Implicated in uh, things like Parkinson's disease, they actually found that lectins can actually track up the vagus nerve and get into the substantia nigra and, and damage uh, your cells there and are implicated and thought to be a part of Parkinson's or at least a contributing factor to Parkinson's. Yeah, he actually fear mongers about essentially beans causing Parkinson's, which is completely crazy here. And looking to this study, a certain dietary pattern was associated with lower Parkinson's risk. Quote, the healthy diet as identified in our analysis was characterized by a high consumption of fruit, vegetables, legumes, which are loaded with lectins, that wasn't in the quote, and cereals and a low consumption of meats. And broad beans, which have been described as among the highest in lectins of any of these beans, well, they are actually a effective treatment for Parkinson's disease, which is crazy. Here's Dr. Gregor of NutritionFacts.org on the topic. Parkinson's patients were fed about one and a third cups of cooked fava beans, and during the next four hours, a substantial clinical improvement was noted. In fact, similar to the improvement seen after receiving the standard pharmacological combination of L-DOPA plus carbidopa. And, uh, and they can also, through molecular mimicry, uh, is now impl implicated in autoimmune diseases. So these lectins obviously are foreign agents. They get into your body, and your body doesn't like that, and so it attacks them with, uh, with um, antibodies that now attack your, your normal cells. You know, autoimmune diseases are inflammatory, so do those kings of lectin slash legumes lead to some dumpster fire of inflammation within the body of say maybe these Iranian women where they looked at this topic? No, legumes, including those evil lentils, were associated with lower inflammation levels, in particular 40% lower C-reactive protein, which is an inflammation marker. And just from Harvard really quickly, the benefit of eating lectin containing food far outweighs the harm. That is pretty well put. All right, now let's get into his claims around phytates. Phytates, you have phytic acid, they're in some plants. These will bind to minerals, making mineral salts, and they will stop your body from being able to absorb these like you know, calcium and, and magnesium, and then it's it's an unbreakable bond. We, we don't have the machinery to break those two apart. Oh, we don't have the machinery, well, it appears from this study that just simulating a vegetarian digestive system degraded 100% you know, of the phytate, which might actually be a shame because as I've mentioned before, phytates have anti-cancer properties. But if you're still concerned soaking and sprouting and fermenting and various techniques lower the phytate content, but to knock out just general health concerns about lectins and phytates all at once because they are in highest in legumes. Well, from this study, the number one dietary predictor of elderly survival, the best food for old people across the world to live longer was legumes. All right, now let's get on to one that I haven't covered as much, and that is tannins. Here he is. Tannins, they can block digestive enzymes, slow growth, and at high doses can even cause uh, kidney damage or liver necrosis at high enough levels. Tannins are pretty bitter and gross, and we generally avoid them in high concentrations, but there are some things that we really like that have you know pretty high levels of tannins, such as tea, coffee, chocolate, and red wine. 
And this is another one where in you know reasonable amounts, they have antioxidant properties. And from this study, some benefits didn't make it into his presentation, weirdly, of them being antiviral, cardioprotective, anti-diabetic, anti-inflammatory, and specifically anti-tumor. Weird, he didn't say that. There is a concern here that tannins are going to be blocking iron absorption, but from this paper, quote, long-term animal model, epidemiologic and multi-meal studies generally do not support changes in iron status related to tannin intake. So if you do studies on a single meal, you can show some results, but it doesn't appear in real life to affect things. Now, and tea is super widely consumed across the world, so we have a lot of data on it. It's very high in tannins compared to other foods and drinks, you know, between you know, 30 and 80 milligrams per cup, higher than coffee. Red wine on average is higher, but looking to the data, yeah, tea consumption and coffee consumption, might as well mention that, are over and over again associated with lower mortality. Do we do we see a pattern here at all? Tannins aren't killing us, and even if you are concerned, you could take an extra bit of effort and drink tea not around meals where you're trying to absorb nutrients. Now we get to another really scary one, cyanide in plants. Cyanogenic glycosides, and these exist in things like cassava root, which is a very important root, which we'll talk about, also almonds and bitter almonds. Long-term exposure to even low-grade cyanide uh, can cause serious thyroid and neurological damage. I do actually remember hearing people talk about, oh, the apple seeds actually have some cyanide in them. Isn't that so crazy? So yeah, it turns out Johnny Appleseed was actually just one of our first serial killers. He then points to cassava, you know, a major food source in the tropical parts of the world as well as almonds. But the situation here is that we found ways to process cassava to massively lower the cyanide content. You know, raw cassava might have between 100 to 300 parts per million of cyanide, but then we're cooking it down to have less than 10 parts per million, oftentimes only one part per million after the processing. But yeah, there is a risk of messing it up and having people get sick, but ill-prepared plant food dangers are dwarfed by just the dangers of preparing meat. As you can see from this list of top 10 pathogens, you know, eating animal products sickens hundreds of thousands of people per year, which of course causes a lot of deaths. But people do eat almonds, and people don't realize that 400 to 800 grams of almonds can be a lethal dose of cyanide in an adult. Now, I could check the math here, but we could be even less biased than me doing it and have you know a registered dietitian like here on Livestrong who already did it. They say that to be poisoned, you would have to eat over 1,100 almonds, and their conclusion is that the benefits of almonds far outweigh the risks. Next, he gets into nightshades, which really have gotten a bad rap in the alternative health space recently. Nightshades, night literally we've known about these things being harmful for thousands of years. And yet we, you know, this is like belladonna, deadly nightshade and tobacco. Uh, they create, uh, they, they use a, a toxin called solanine among other things. But we regularly eat potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, capsicums. You know, it, I'm sure some people truly react to these, but you know, the science is not making a strong case for that large scale. You know, is the solanine talks about poisoning people? Well, those super evil dark red tomatoes, what are they doing to us? Well, from this study, tomato consumption is actually associated with lower mortality, not killing us. And in particular from this one, lower prostate cancer, a top deadly cancer. Be very scared though. It goes further from this study, sufficient lycopene intake could reduce the risk of prostate cancer by about 60%. That is insane. Potatoes, we used to peel them. Now, oh, well, that's all where all the, the nutrients and the vitamins are is in the skin. Like, right, that's where all the poison is too. Talks about the skins of potatoes being so dangerous. Well, what happens if you give men, for example, various types of potatoes with different levels of these chemicals in the skins, like white, yellow, and purple tomatoes, like this study did. The results, pigmented potato consumption reduced inflammation and DNA damage in healthy adult males. Guess what? The purple ones, the scariest ones, were the best. And they cite the antioxidant content for that. And from elsewhere, I've heard it concerned that nightshades like shred your gut lining. Well, from this study, directly applying potato compounds to the gut lining increased healing. Well, that might just be kind of a petri dish situation. Looking to actual people from this randomized control trial, which was a crossover even better on people with metabolic syndrome, they gave them either a dietary guidelines appropriate diet with potatoes or one with bagels. Then they switched the diets and the results were 
quote, the incorporation of resistant starch containing potatoes into a healthy diet reduces small intestinal permeability. We're talking about gut leakiness. You have phytoestrogens that can that can have an estrogenic effect in your body. Uh, I was speaking to someone uh, just last week and they said that their doctor uh, their oncologist, because they had breast cancer, didn't want them eating red meat because of all the hormones that were in uh, meat. The phytoestrogens in soy is over 1 million nanograms per three ounces. So don't eat meat. What do you replace it with? You replace it with plants that have even more phytoestrogens. Okay, this is really interesting because he's talking about a case where hey, you shouldn't stop eating meat in terms of breast cancer, but oh, soy seems like it would be really dangerous in terms of breast cancer, but he couldn't be further from the truth here from this study. Yeah, increased consumption of red meat was associated with increased risk of invasive breast cancer, yet from studies like this one, soy was associated with lower breast cancer risk, probably the worst example he could have used. Soy has been shown to reduce reproduction in sheep, lower sperm counts, and can derange your, your sex hormone ratios. This is where clearly we are different or more adapted than animals to consume this because from studies like this one, it doesn't appear that even super high concentrated levels of phytoestrogens that we would never eat are able to change sex blood hormone levels. And if we only had a large soy consuming population to just see if they were all completely infertile, oh, well, Asia happens to be the most populated area of the earth, higher soy consumption. And along those lines, I found this Insta clip of him saying that vegan sperm counts are in the tank. Vegans and vegetarians have much lower rates of, of cholesterol. They have really poor hormonal health. Their uh, sperm counts are in the tank. No citation. And even though it isn't a huge study, we have this one that found that vegan sperm counts were nearly twice as high as meat eaters. And the vegans had 17 times as much high motility sperm, which is more effective and way less DNA damaged sperm. Side note, vegan men have higher total and equivalent free testosterone to meat eaters. So he's just spewing out his fiber deficient butt. The protein that's in plants is, is not bioavailable. Then why did this study in older adults who have worse digestive absorption show that their muscle mass was determined not by whether they were eating animal or plant protein, but by total protein intake? No difference for animal versus plant protein for them. And in the end, he puts forth a theory that is just the exact opposite of what our scientific consensus is at this point, which is that you know all of these chronic diseases are actually caused by plant toxins. And he says that we need to eat more meat to prevent them. The so-called chronic diseases that we treat are not diseases per se, but toxicities and malnutrition toxic buildup of species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition, namely too many plants, not enough meat. My response to this is that, well, maybe plants are trying to kill us. They are failing to do so, helping us live longer, but animals, even though they're not trying to kill us with their meat compounds, they appear to be very effectively doing so. And that's because saturated animal fat and cholesterol raises LDL or bad cholesterol, which is causally linked to atherosclerosis, you know, which fuels heart disease, cardiovascular diseases, which are our leading killers. Wait, Brussels sprout carcinogens wasn't on the top 10 causes of death? In the end, I hope you can see that all of these plants are lowering our risk of all of the diseases and death that he is scaring you about. And in so many cases, he just got it backwards. Oh, soy, scary for breast cancer, actually better. Cruciferous vegetables, carcinogenic, oh, actually lower cancer risk. Phytates and tannins, so scary, oh, actually antioxidant or anti-cancer properties. You know, and those lectins in beans, so scary, well, actually they're associated with elderly survival more than any other food on the planet. He's just super duper wrong. And I have to mention that the carnivore diet that he is eating, as I've covered in the past, is a super high emissions diet that is horrible for the planet and obviously horrible for animals. We'd end up killing way more animals using way more resources to feed people that way. And finally, if you would like to try out Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, you can click the link below and use the code Mike at checkout for 30% off your first month's supply. Again, after April 25th, it will go back down, but that'll be there for you. And let me know down below what you think about all of this and its claims. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Nuclear nectarines? horseradish hitmen, or weapons of mass daikon.